There is no single entity today that can drive innovation like the open source community can. And so a part of what really, a part of what we want to do is embrace the community, provide opportunities for them to get engaged and help drive inner innovation around our core technology. Hi, this is your host, Sapnul Bharatiya, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk. And today we have with us Andrew Atkin, Chief Open Source Officer at Herrera. Andrew, it's great to have you back on the show. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm excited to be here, truly. Of course, we are going to discuss Hedera and you joining the company. But before we go there, um, I would love to just talk about uh, the company. What do you folks do? Because if I'm not wrong, I have met you before at one of the open source conferences when you are working uh, with Vipro. But this is the first time we are talking to somebody from Hedera. So I'd love to know a bit about the company. So Hedera is a uh, public permission blockchain. Um, we're, our focus is we are an enterprise focus and kind of what really sets us apart is our governance model. So we are governed by a uh, council of 29 different uh, organizations such as Google, IBM, Dell, Boeing, Standard Bank, and many others. So we have a distributed uh, council or governance model. That's a little bit unique in this space. Um, we also, uh, what sets us apart a bit is our consensus model. So we are proof of stake, like Ethereum, as opposed to proof of work, like Bitcoin. Uh, and in that context, we, uh, our, our founder, uh, Lehman Baird, uh, created this technology for driving consensus that is very, very efficient, very fast, and low carbon impact. So that's one of the, another uh, aspect of our of our DLT that really sets us up uh, being in the DLT space that sets us apart. We are uh, empirically one of the lowest carbon impact blockchains that exist today. Now let's talk about what attracted you to join this company. A few things. So Wipro, the company I spent nine years at before this as um, global open source, uh, head of global open source there, uh, is a council member actually of Hedera. And in that context, Hedera, uh, all of the software at Hedera is open source under the Apache license. And they were looking to identify how to develop their open source strategy. So they reached out to a couple of council members uh, and Wipro being one of them, Wipro said, well, we actually have someone who might be able to help you. So for about six months, I spent a few hours a week here and there helping them develop their overall open source strategy. Uh, actually ended up writing my own job description, which at the time I didn't know uh, was going to be the case um, <clears throat> because they had decided that they did want to hire a chief open source officer to drive to, to drive the strategy and the implementation at Hedera. So I had a bit of a benefit of getting to know who they are, uh, uh, the people, the organization, and so on. It's a new space for me, right? I've, I've been in open source for 25 years, but and, and of course, understand the fundamentals of blockchain because it's all open source, right? Pretty much. Uh, but I'm not, but I didn't have experience in this whole Web3 space, but I had that opportunity to get to know the company. And about four months ago, we had one of our council meetings in, in Santa Clara and they invited me to attend. Uh, and I remember sitting in that room and there must have been 70 or 80 people there. And uh, at that time I was not considering this as an opportunity, but I remember sitting in that room so clearly and thinking, these are some of the smartest people I have ever met in my career in technology. I want to be a part of it. And so then I, I reached out to the board and the CEO, a uh, president, and, and said, I, I would like to be considered for this role. And it kind of went from there. And here I am. And, and really happy. I'm excited. Uh, you know, I enjoyed, certainly enjoyed the work I did at Wipro and left on good terms with them. They're still a council member. But I am really, really excited uh, to be here. There's so much cool stuff going on in this space. Thanks for sharing your journey. Now let's talk about the the problem area, the challenges that Hedera is going to solve or Hedera is solving. Let's just talk about, just take a, you know, a wider lens and look at this industry, how you have seen the evolution of technology like Web3 DLT in this space. So interesting that, that I did choose to join this space during what people are calling the crypto winter, right? Um, but it, it doesn't, it didn't, 
shock or appall me uh, to become a part of it at this time because I remember going through the early the early days of the internet, right, and how that evolved. How there's an incredible amount of of uh, churn and shakeout and the entities that came through the initial, you know, stage one of the internet, let's say, really were stronger organizations. And what I really, really appreciate about Hedera uh, that helped kind of bring me to this, making the decision to join this space at this time, is the, the nature of the, of the distributed governance model here and the fact that we have so many big brands, big organizations that are clearly invested in making this organization successful. That was really important for me to see, that they're not just a bunch of logos slapped on a page, right? We actually have real engagement. Now, one of the challenges, going, going to the challenges in this space is, you know, we, we have a committed number of council members but we need to also bring them to the open source community, right? That, that's why I'm here, is to develop our strategy, to grow a community, and we, we need to get our council members engaged. We need to provide a strong set of tools and environments and user journey to get the Web3 community involved. We have a passionate group of, of open source contributors. We have a lot of people that are writing apps on, on top of our network. Um, but we need to help them get more engaged in actually participating in the community. And so that's that's one of the, the, the first actions that I'm focusing on. And when we are talking about, you know, distributed ledgers, we have to talk about open source, we have to talk about a hyperledger project. What kind of involvement Hedera has with this foundation, with this project, and what kind of adoption you're seeing in the market? Yeah, so we're we're certainly a member of the Hyperledger Foundation, uh, and we are. Uh, it, uh, Hyperledger Fabric is integrated with our with our platform. We have some plugins there, and so we certainly are are both users, producers, and consumers uh, in that space. Uh, we're actually talking with IBM and other members of, about this the new project that was recently raised to full project status called Cacti. So one of the big issues around the whole space that we're looking at is interoperability. That, that's a big, big challenge. At the end of the day, there, it, there's not going to be a single universal blockchain, no matter what some, some folks may say. There will be different blockchains for different purposes with different use cases, essentially uh, focused on a particular blockchain. So interoperability is really, really important interoperability uh, that allows you to, to transact across different blockchains for different purposes with different types of permissions. Um, interoperability in wallets today is also one of the big challenges. We're, we're joining the Open Wallet Foundation, which is another Linux Foundation project, because uh, we believe we have, a, we have a lot to offer there. So one of, if you look at Fabric or Besu or Cacti, uh, one of the core kind of tenets I feel of Hyperledger is to provide the ability for more interoperability between different blockchains. And so that's that's what I think is one of the absolute core values and one of the reasons that we're invested in, in it. How important is open source for Hedera itself? Yeah, so it's a part of, we're really focused on being a true decentralized organization in this space, right? And, and that's why we have a des decentralized governance model. Um, and that's what we we believe in the in the software. We have we bought the rights from the founders a few years ago to the Hashgraph consensus algorithm. We made it open open source under the Apache license, and we're really working hard to build a distributed community around it. Because as as you know, Swapno, being at the Linux Foundation, there is no single entity today that can drive innovation like the open source community can. And so, a part of what really a part of what we want to do is embrace the community, provide opportunities for them to get engaged and help drive inner innovation around our core technology. Open source is better, is, as you know, is better for all. And that's really what we wanna do is provide a functional, innovative blockchain that is based on open source principles and best practices. Since we are talking about open source, I do want to talk to you as your industry veteran. Some of the disturbing trends, though, we keep seeing these things, you know, over a period of time, ever since the FSF or open source license came to exist. 
But uh, when we look at the things that HashiCorp is doing or when Red Hat tried to do something with CentOS, which may be seen more of a, a miscommunication than a malicious intentions, but things are changing. How do you look at these trends and what role you see foundations like Linux Foundation, OSI, can play here. Of course, this time, Linux Foundation, they did come up with Open Tofu. So I want to hear your thoughts on that. So a little bit of perspective. First off, if you look back at my career, I, it, for me, it's always been bringing a practical approach to, to open source. Uh, I was probably one of the very first people to actually wear a suit in open source way back when, because that was what was needed at the time. Uh, I've worked on with dozens of organizations on their open source related business models. Um, so there is, I, I get the rationale. I get the reason for why some of these organizations have some have made some of these license changes. And to me, it's been a little bit less about the actual change, although creating licenses that aren't OSI compliant is definitely not something I support. But I get the rationale, I get the concern, I get what they're trying to do. I think a lot of the failure has actually come about in the execution of how they've gone about that, how they've messaged it, how some of these communities have been blindsided. Uh, and, and you're always going to lose if, in, in, in that case, right? Um, so I think it's, it's really about continuing to listen and engage with your community get their feedback. Uh, at the end of the day, I, I think we all recognize that some of these, for some of these really cool, innovative open source technologies to continue to grow and be available, there needs to be commercial uh, value proposition behind them. And that's a part of what, what I'm working on actually with, with our community is helping a lot of these people who are building applications that run on top of the network, understand the commercial rationale for actually getting involved in the community. All right. Um, what my observation, my, my three and a half month ob observation in the Web3 space is that there is actually less understanding of the commercial value of open source than there is in what we might think of as the Web2 community. Before we wrap this up, of course, uh, I wish we had more time, but I have to get into another recording. So uh, <laughs> I will wrap it up quickly. Sorry for that. Sorry to our audience as well. But uh, I, I want to talk a bit about Web3. Of course, there's a lot of communication, there's a lot of miscommunication, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of misinformation. What is Web3 and what kind of new use cases that you see it will enable that were not possible without it? What I'm perhaps most excited about is the opportunity to, to improve uh, our, our planet through Web3 technologies and, and new business models. Um, it's there's certainly a new way of doing finance and, and it's bringing sophisticated financial capabilities to the disadvantaged, the unbanked, that, that's going to happen. But that's going to happen whether or not we have, essentially, I believe, whether we or not we have this, this uh, technology horizon called Web3. But it is really enabling a lot more opportunity to help improve the planet. The use cases that I'm seeing around sustainability are just fascinating. And so that's something that I'm, I'm really excited about also. And you thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about these wide range of topics. And as I said, there's so much to talk about. We don't have time today, but I would love to have you back on the show. Thank you. Swaminil, thank you very much. Uh, great conversation, good questions, and I look forward to continuing.